Today on the show, we take a look back at some of the past lessons that I've learned and really taken away from season two of Loki Legends thus far. Looking at leadership lessons from Emmett Shine, practical tips on cultivating an audience with Dan Maul, tactics on turning weaknesses into strengths with Kirk Wallace, and exploring the power of transparency in our businesses with self-aware. That's a little bit of what you can look forward to, but plenty more. Think of this as your audio buffet, your journey into an episode without investing an hour and 30 minutes. So you can learn about the guests in a little bit more detail and hear some of my favorite tips and techniques along the way. I encourage you to check out all of the episodes and dive in more, but that's enough from me. Let's kick things off with illustrator and designer, Kirk Wallace. How do you think about your individual weaknesses? How do you kind of turn those weaknesses into strengths and kind of how has it impacted your style and how you kind of create on a day-to-day basis? I'm like on a kick right now, like your weakness is your superpower. I think shifting away from even the content mind right now, just, yeah, I'm shifting focus, but like, yeah, just from like what I do, I get a lot of comments around like, how do you make your style? Or like, I'm very shape driven with my work. <clears throat> I'm not very, I'm detail oriented in a certain way, but I'm not like, I don't draw like I did a skill share on like how to draw self portrait, but it wasn't like this is how you do like your nose and your jawline and charcoal and shit like that. I'm like, no, like what makes you you and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, point is, is I'm not a very I don't know how to draw hair. Like if I'm gonna draw a horse, you, you could either like really focus on how all the hair looks and like how the muscles like do their thing. That's how you communicate a horse. Or for me, I'm like, dude, I don't know how to do any of that. So I'm gonna have to like lean heavy into like shape language of like, this is like what it looks like in a really flat thing. So my style as a result is like very shape driven. It's very uh, primitive. um, And it leans heavily into my inability to draw, quite frankly. And I I don't say that in like a cutesy way, like, oh, I don't know how to draw. Like drawing is not like a natural skill for me. I'm not like, I don't draw often unless I have to. Um, I like making images. I like communicating stories. I don't like sitting down like a blank paper and like just sketching things out. And some people do. And I definitely envy that, or I did envy that for a really long time, still do a little bit. But lately I'm like, no, I think like my, like I've drawn, (laughs) I've probably drawn, let's say pizza is like the thing I've drawn the most. And I, it probably isn't, but I still have drawn it so few times that every time i do it i'm like relearning what it looks like and so like i bet if you took all the times i've drawn pizza for instance they would look drastically different because they're not relying on each other's like past drawing at all like it's not like oh i drew this yesterday and now it's getting a little better it's like i'm just like learning how to draw it when i'm 24 i'm having to relearn it when i'm 27 (laughs) when i'm 30 and i'm like so I think it's also like pushes me to kind of create new things really often. My style is often maybe developing again out of necessity because I'm kind of always relearning it because uh, I don't have a ton of muscle memory. Cause, but I think that that's a superpower. I think like I, I definitely, there's one thing that I've found confidence in saying is that I'm comfortable saying that other people say that I have a really defined style and I don't hmm. necessarily disagree. And I definitely attribute that to um, my inability to draw very traditionally and really just kind of come in sideways at the way that I think things look. Um, and so, yeah, that, that weakness, is super powerful. I think everybody has that, right? Like, and we learn that from like little kids and kids books and stuff like that of like those things that you think make you kind of like weird or unique are actually the things that make you really cool and shiny and unique, like a snowflake and stuff like that. Um, but it's been cool for me to see that like very specifically with like inability to draw equals really unique style. <laughs> it's like, wow, how do you, how do you come up with such interesting shapes? I'm like, cause I'm just figuring it out every time. <laughs> there must be something in there where it's like, okay, I realize that I can't do, you know, what this person is doing, but there also must be a certain aspect of like, I'm also focusing on things that I like to do. So like, there's some aspect of like, okay, the Kirk Wallace style is like, oh, I like this aspect. I like this texture. I like this look. So are are there aspects in there that you've kind of brought to the forefront and are always in every sort 
every Kirk Wallace bonehouse piece. I like smushing things down as simply as possible. And that probably comes from just like being really into like Swiss design and minimalism mm. and also like, you know, cave paintings and stuff like that. But I'm intrigued at the idea. I think I'm also just kind of an asshole. Like I'm, I'm very snooty. Like I, you know, I'm like, I'm definitely a, it was better on vinyl kind of asshole as well. And so I'm like, how can I give them, like, I don't want to, I don't want it to be on the nose. How can I make it as not on the nose as possible? So it's like, what can I give if I'm going to do, um, pizza, you know, it's not going to be a triangle. How can I do pizza as a square or something like, but it also going to give you the colors so that, you know, it's pizza. But if I'm going to do, if I'm going to do it a triangle, it's going to be blue. Like I want to give you as much as you need to be able to build the story in your head, but I don't want to give you everything to make it too easy. And I'm sure there's a more concise way to put that, or there's like a principle. Um, but yeah, I just, I like subtracting, subtracting, subtracting. It's like Picasso's bull or whatever. Right? It's like, mm -hmm. how much can you strip down and still communicate effectively without any of the extra fluff? And part of that also is laziness from an execution perspective for me. Like, I don't love, like, I don't want to draw like a whole entire scene or whatever, like a background and all that shit. Um, but I am not lazy when it comes to ideas. Like, I'm like, okay, well, how can I cleverly still teach people that they're in a stadium or the background is a forest without drawing all those damn trees and clouds and perspective and depth and all mm -hmm. that? It's like, mm -hmm. all right, well, then if we just put a green blob up here, that'll look like a tree. And then we put some like dirty stuff down there that looks like a ground. Cool. It's done. And then as a result, at the same time, I get to kind of like ret retroactively be like, oh, yeah, I'm doing like I'm I'm trying to, you know, give the viewer as little as possible which i think i kind of am but it's like it stems out of laziness which again stems mm. out of like a weakness <laughs> but yeah i really like trying to simplify things down as much as possible and give give the viewer is only what they need and maybe that's also just like a respect to people's time too <laughs> yeah yeah that makes sense i heard this really cool story about the prolific choreographer bob fossey and okay. If you're not familiar, which I'm assuming a lot of the audience is not, but um, he's very famous for doing musical theater dance in the jazz space. And okay. he worked in Hollywood on a bunch of like the, I guess like old movie musicals, but then is pretty famous for his work um, on like Broadway. So like uh, sure. Chicago, for instance, is one of his big shows. And this is all getting to a point, but Bob Fosse was not very tall. He had like some sort of like body problem with his pelvis where it was more extended forward. Okay. And he was super self-conscious about his balding hairline. So okay. he always would wear a hat. Like, and there's a lot of hat choreography and there's sure. a lot of choreography where his pelvis is like very forward. And this applies. Sure. So he's just literally taking the things that are like he hates and just turned it into a, a prolific dance style that is recognized and honored. Oh, so see that's and awesome. has evolved throughout the years. Yeah. So it's like, what makes you weird or like what literally can you not do? Just focus on the things that you love that make you unique. But also it's like if you can't do something, don't try to do something that someone else is doing because you can't do it. Like <laughs> literally can't. Yeah. Like for me personally, just like a to sure. bring it back to Please. a personal connection is like I'm not an organized designer. I keep okay. all like my business systems like organized and I try right. to be organized on that front in my communication to clients, but I don't love grids. I don't love like a clean artboard. I don't use all the Figma tools. Like I literally barely know how to use the tool itself. Sure. And I think that is a superpower because I literally don't give a shit about like the grid or anything. <laughs> and I'm just like, what looks cool? What looks good? What's telling like and conveying this message? What's an interesting idea? And I work with people that are in very organized. And when you're developing something, it has to be clean. So it's like, how do I take my messy, crazy mm. idea and clean it up at the very end so that it like works and there's systems and there's like a process and there's thought and, you know, getting people on your team that like, don't mind your bullshit. <laughs> Cause somebody else's superpower is to clean things and yeah. to organize them and stuff like that. I think that's also another, you know, thing that we'll talk about on the next 
time you have me on the podcast, but it's like collaboration and all of that, which I'm sure you've seen an outrageous benefit from. And I've seen a, a pretty tremendous one too, but yeah, yeah, somebody else will have that thing that is able to turn it into what it needs to be. Um, but yeah, I think that's fantastic of like, because sometimes that would also, I think about that for me, if I went to art school, they would have told me like, oh, you got to learn charcoal or you got to learn like value structures and all this shit. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm not an artist. I can't do this. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And I would have bailed very quickly. But because I cheated my way in and then I let the internet tell me that I'm an artist or whatever, it worked out really well. But like, I'm thinking like if you were forced to do, use the tools exactly where they are, have your margins, your grids and all this stuff, you might be like, I'm not very good at this or or i don't or people might not buy it like you might not have success at all um whereas the way that you do things now is extremely like unique and interesting and cool and like you said it ends up getting rinsed through the thing in the end where like it it doesn't look like this complete like avant-garde like piece where it's like well this guy's really out there in the end it gets packaged into a tidy thing but that's like just like the last 10 percent. it's like most of the storytelling and the interesting creativity is happening unstructured and then at the end it's like yeah just rinse it through the laundromat where it obviously ends up like being accessible for web and accessible for mobile and stuff like that but that's like almost more of a a a factory thing Mm -hmm. in the end it's like the the heart of it is really in the chaos that you have so yeah your weakness is your superpower yeah honestly i think it is it's like my inability to focus on one thing <laughs> at a time has probably given me the, the my greatest strength but also like my wife's greatest agony <laughs> but also your most charm like it's yeah. yeah it's it's everything is in balance or whatever everything that's a pain in the ass is a beautiful thing mostly and yeah I, every time i mention the like weakness is your power thing it always it seems to ring true to a lot of people but it also seems so fundamental that I'm like, mm. I, not that I'm saying I invented anything, but it's like, like, do people need to be reminded of this? But then every time I mention it, people are like, oh, that's really fun. And I'm really, I've got a kick off of it lately. It's been my latest thing. So I hope that people also kind of get a rise out of it and then think about what their weakness is and then mm. hopefully find some, I, I, everyone does though. Every time I've mentioned mm-hmm. it to anyone, they're like, oh yeah, like just like you did just now. It's like, they're like, oh, what do I kind of suck at? And they're like, <laughs> but. <laughs> and I think a lot of humans are like, oh, look at how good they are and and have like a a, a bit of self negativity almost. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm not doing that. It's like, well, should you be? Right. If you literally can't, then why would you strive to do that? It's like, right. I think that I think that's also like kind of where punk music gets a lot of its charm, because a lot of those punk musicians can't read music didn't take lessons they just picked up (laughs) guitar and started fucking around until like something came out (laughs) that's like exactly what i was thinking as you were just saying that is like i feel like if you asked any like ignorance is bliss came to mind for a moment and then i just thought about like any yeah like any musician that is yeah really prolific they probably were like i don't fucking know what i was doing Mm -hmm. it was especially like hardcore and punk music it's like and it's not to take away from their skills or anything, but it's like their skills were in their energy and in their love and in their passion and things like that. And nobody was really paying attention to the academic musical theory to what mm-hmm. they were doing at all and no. still aren't. And 99% of people that are looking at our work are not, they might be looking at it from a critical, like, how did he do that? I'm curious so I can replicate it, but they're not like, he didn't even use a grid. Like nobody fucking gives a shit. And if they do like they're, they're looking in their own, it's not, we know that story is the most important aspect of any creativity or maybe anything ever. So, and story is never found in, perfect execution that's not where it's it's not where the dna lies i don't think one thing to drive that home is that martin luther king's i have a dream speech didn't start as that he came to the podium with a entirely different speech started giving it realized that the audience was not Mm. receptive of it took a second put it away and then just off the cuff Mm. i have a dream so instead of speaking, I did not know that. like, yeah, it's crazy. He was like giving a speech that was like, 
how we're going to solve this problem like stats. Yeah, sure. Some boring shit, right? Yeah. And then he decided to speak from the heart and tell this prolific story that has changed probably millions of people's lives yeah, and made I a huge that. impact in the civil rights movement and the world in general. And that was because he stopped mm. and thought about what personally was important and shared that. And read the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you also <laughs> have to do. You have to read the room. He wasn't like, I'm going to double down. I worked really hard on this speech. He's like, yeah, no, it's the empathy too thing too, right? It's like being receptive to like, what are people going to be interested in? Mm. And yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't realize that. But it makes perfect sense, too. It's a little bit crazy of an idea to do mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if anyone would have the courage to do that. But like, it's also like, yeah, doubling down on something that's not working is not going to work. Obviously, you have to be as articulate as someone like he was. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. inspiring. That's cool. Someone that incredible can learn from a mistake. Like, I need to learn from mine and continue to like push and improve and get better. I love finding out that I didn't come up with anything like, <laughs> you know, like I really do. Cause yeah. I'm like, Oh good. That means like, I'm not, cause sometimes I'm so scared to give advice to it. Cause it, I'm like, it seems like this clusterfuck of an idea, mm -hmm. but then I'm like, Oh, it's already been invented thousands of years ago by some philosopher or whatever. I'm like, Oh, so then I can kind of like regurgitate it and feel like, you know, it's nice to reference somebody that's already mentioned it before. Cause I guess it just proves you're not crazy. <laughs> A lot of like everything that we're doing is, repackaging things that already exist and then translating it to a specific audience that resonates uh, with you. So, I mean, I think that's good to know too. It's like nothing is probably new. It's just mm -hmm. a refactoring of different ideas, repackaging, placing it in front of people that may have not seen it before. Placing it in front of people that have not seen it before is also very interesting to me. Just in like a very specific, but like that's something I always get hung up on. I when I, first, when I made my first class, I was like, well, so-and-so, like in my head, Glenn Thomas, like my favorite illustrator. I'm like, Glenn Thomas isn't going to learn anything from this class. Why am I going to bother putting it out? And it's like, it's not for him. <laughs> like, eh, like every other person that has not studied illustration or character design or whatever. And lo and behold, I put the class out and a lot of people were like, wow, this is all very unique, new, interesting information to me. And I'm like, well, I can't believe that. It's like, no shit. But <laughs> yeah, knowing that like, yeah, you can just bring something or my brother has been learning like Illustrator and Photoshop and stuff lately. And every once in a while, I, like screen share with him or show him something. And he's like, well, hold, slow it down. He's like, you can do a whole video on the like, button you just pressed. Like not everybody is in tune to the stupid bullshit that you are. Mm -hmm. And again, empathetically, I realize that like when I talk to any friends that are really good at other things like music or whatever, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. there's a reason why they make music this way or whatever. It's like, slow down. So yeah, realizing you, you just put it very easy to, there's a service in taking things that are hidden away and just bringing them into light. And that's not stealing yeah. or copying. It's just like sharing that information. And not everybody has that same specific YouTube algorithm that you do, where you just so happen to learn about like every type of backpack for <laughs> six months or whatever. It's like, but then you're like, yo, I know everything about backpacks. I got you. Like, <laughs> wait, so you haven't watched like four hours of like everyday carry backpacks. <laughs> like everyone has different interests. They can, you can learn from anyone. And we can't be making things for our heroes. We probably need to be making yeah. things for the, the person that's like 10 years behind us because yeah. they need to exponentially catch up to like try and get to where we are. But obviously it's like time. How can we save them a little bit of time? How can we, what's the thing that they can take away right now? And they're like, okay, thank you so much. I fucked up big time by waiting too long, making things for heroes, so to speak. Um, and it got in my way. Like I never made things because I was like, well, it's not good enough for the 0.001% of people that I want to see. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? Um, I found so much more happiness lately when I've just like let go and been like, I'm just going to put things out and see if people like it. So refreshing. Excuse me. So refreshing. If one person comments and they're like, yo, this is dope. Like that's a huge win because most people are busy and they're not thinking about you. <laughs> it's so hard to grab people's time. It's so difficult. But the thing is definitely, yeah, don't overthink it. Because even as I start saying, I'm like, why bother? And it's like, no, 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 just do it. Mm. Just have fun. Because yeah, then fun. you'll start grabbing a couple people. And then like suddenly you'll start seeing people like 
comment often. You're like, oh shit, I'm like helping these people out. That's really nice. That feels really good. And then hopefully some brand comes along that has like way bigger reach and is like, we're going to take you and help you be able to impact more people, Mm -hmm. which is like, you know, my goal of like, okay, cool. Now let me like use the platform of other people to prove my message because I can only get my platform so big. I mean, with your platform in general, like, did you see like slow and steady growth or was there kind of like a massive spike at certain point or when you changed up what you were doing or sharing or how? I guess what's been the trajectory of of your kind of career, but also your, I guess, like social growth? And is there a correlation between the two? I think the simplest correlation is every time I've thought less, shared more without spamming, Mm. which again, with that, that alignment thing of like, I never spam anywhere. I always have quality in mind. So I'm not worried about that. So I could post every day and feel comfortable. Um, Every time I've done that, whether that's on Dribbble, Behance, Tumblr, Twitter, um, whatever the other one, Instagram, stuff like that. I've always seen much more growth, which is also just quite frankly, like a, an unemotional fact to it is like, yeah, you got to sh- post often. If you're not going to don't bother. If, if you're doing it purely therapeutically and you enjoy posting, have at it. If you're looking to reach people, which I don't think there's anything wrong with. Mm-mm. I know there's a lot of like talk fairly of like, your validation shouldn't come from your reach, especially with giant megacorps in front of it. Like they shouldn't give you your value. That said, myself personally making visual art or visual mediums, I want people to see it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to go to, you know, a park and start holding it up in the air. So I'm going to share it on the internet. So I'm going to leverage every tool I can to make sure that I get seen as many people as possible, as many people that I want to be seeing it as possible. I don't care if people that are, I don't want eyes that are uninterested. But so with that, I try to follow the rules as best I can. So like, yeah, my correlation has been like, every time I've been like, fucking, I'm going to post every day, regardless. Um, it's been super beneficial. And then I've caught a big bunch of people, many of which are useless for lack of better terms. But if you grow 10,000 people, there might be 50 or 100 people in there that are like, oh, mm-hmm. I really like this dude's work now. I'm going to follow him closely. And maybe two or three or five of those people are going to be like, I love this dude's work and I'm going to buy everything he puts out or I'm going to listen to you know everything he says. And the only way to find the people that really resonate with what you're doing is to cast a really big net. And I think that's where tools like reels and stuff are great for casting a super big net. Admittedly, the inflation of it, of like my account, when I started posting like daily two years ago for like a month straight or two months straight, because I was so fed up with like everything. I was like, you know what? I'm going to post every day. Be, just to break my brain to stop thinking about like oh what if it doesn't like it's like guess what idiots i'm gonna get another post tomorrow it was almost this like funny chip on my shoulder where i'm like i'm gonna post again tomorrow so i don't even care if it doesn't get any engagement and then lo and behold coincidentally that's when it started mm-hmm. going up um but it also could be frustrating because it's like yeah it grew a ton but like my engagement hasn't grown a ton because a lot it's catching a lot of stuff yeah but it's not always catching quality but I have found 10, 20, 100 new people that I recognize are like, oh, these people really like my work. And I definitely wouldn't have caught them if I wasn't casting a really big net. Because mm-hmm. there's no like sniping fish in the sea as big as Instagram, right? Like you have to like grab them and kind of filter them through and let yeah. them find their way to you. So yeah, I've found a correlation with all the obvious of like authenticity, and all the things we talked about, but even just more like tactically. Mm-hmm. Um. Po- I'm trying to like find the root of it though. Like for me, posting every day on Instagram or posting frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, but more importantly, reading the room for Instagram, that is posting often. For Behance, maybe it's posting long, thorough things like certain, you know, certain places yeah. desire different uh, executions. But yeah, just always like trying to like read the. I always like attribute it to like or liken it to tattoos right like you can go on pinterest and find this like really beautiful like tiger painting and be like all right i want to get that tattooed on my arm and a tattoo artist is gonna be like 
we it's not going to translate like this is mm-hmm. not designed for an arm it's not designed for flesh it's not designed the simplicity it's not designed for a round thing like we want to make sure that we make something for it and i think i try to do that with everything that i'm doing if i'm making a t-shirt i'm really leaning into silk screening limited color palettes and texture if i'm doing letterpress if i'm doing this if i'm doing that similarly if i'm posting on behance if i'm posting on dribble if i'm posting on instagram i'm trying to design the content there's nothing worse than like, you know, like it's almost like <laughs> posting YouTube shorts in a whole wide format or something like that. And it's just like, you just re-uploaded that immediately. I'm not going to pay attention to it. Cause I can tell that you're just like using a robot to like regurgitate stuff. So yeah. uh, honoring the platform, I guess, for lack of a better word. What I love about what Kirk said is that just because we're not particularly good at something doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. This breeds new possibilities or even creative constraints. Constraints breed creativity and allow us to navigate around issues instead of heading them directly. So we can spend our time and energy not trying to swim upstream, but leveraging what we do best. This helps us to identify what we're particularly talented at, learning from our weaknesses and turning them into our strengths. Knowing this helps us to better position ourselves in the market, but also as just creative businesses and makers. Leaning in where others are too scared to go, but what feels natural to us. Let's keep the self-improvement train rolling and hear from Emmett Shine on leadership. Through gin lane and pattern, are there other methods or techniques or ways that you have found to better empower your team? I think it's a crucial stage if if there's anyone in at that level that is looking to kind of level up their either management capabilities, leadership capabilities. So I guess this is a twofold question. What are the best ways that you have found for empowering your team to make great work or pushing them in a in a positive way? And then what does good leadership look like to you in this day and age, 2024 into the future? I think that I'm definitely like a better leader than manager. I mm-hmm. I I think management is an art form in itself that I have all, all the world of respect for because I, I also struggle with it. I am pretty unorganized and messy and mm-hmm. I'm not great with like, I'm very organized in other ways, you know, but I think in terms of like what makes a modern knowledge information economy, like manager great. I, mm-hmm. I don't think I have those skill sets. Um, I think, you know, there's so much hygiene of like keeping things on track across a broad spectrum of lower level to higher level tasks. Um, I think I like to, from a management perspective, keep things simple of like, what's the North Star? What does success look like? What's the constraints of reality? Like, what's the timeline? What's the budget? And then just kind of like be given space and latitude to do it. Um, From a leadership perspective, like, I like to paint a vision of where things can go and give context of why they matter. I think that that is important for not just work, but life. It's like, Mm -hmm. why are we doing anything, you know? And it doesn't have to be an outcome again, that's traditionally linear of like success, you know, like, I don't want to lie about a project. Also, if it's work, you know, you're working on something and it's a, I don't know, a candy bar company. It's not going to change the world, but you find a way why you're passionate about it. You know, you really want to do, you know, a great job on this because the the client or something has given you an opportunity to express, you know, your form of uh, an art movement, you know, or this is going to be, you know, done in a way where a percentage of it goes back to this organization. Whatever the motivator is, it's latching on to that singular thing that is super important. And I think like whether it was before Jin Lane or after Jin Lane or pattern, whatever, like I like to challenge people. I like to just say like, I think you have something great in you, period. But for this project, I think there's greatness that we can do together. How how do we really find the time to prioritize and go hard and sweat and like, you know, go above the expected norm? in a way that doesn't destroy your life or cortisol levels, like that's not necessary. You don't need to 
You know, I mean, look, like if you want to be Elon Musk level crazy and do all that level of stuff, like be my guest. I don't want to do that level of crazy stuff. I don't need to figure out where humanity goes next and electrotize whatever the whole world. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, but there's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of pain and a lot of like negative parts that come from pushing that darn hard. I don't want to do that. I want to push my level of hard. I want to try to surround myself with other people that want to push that level of hard, but also want to have a good night's sleep and have a healthy relationship with family and friends. And I think birds of a feather flock together. So trying to find people that are looking for that and then mirroring it back to them and saying, just like I ask people to say to me, Emmett, you can go do an agency that's doodly and artsy with your mom while you know, being respectful and responsible to a business you help build, you can do it. And I'm going, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I try to be that back to other people of like, Hey, this landing page or this design or this business model, like let's push it harder. You can do it. I see excellence in you. And I think that's what mm -hmm. really motivates people is like a good coach or like a good trainer. People could do Pilates or Peloton or whatever, you know, there's jerk people that like, are mean or push you down. And then there's people that can talk to you like the phrase constructive criticism. Like what a great phrase. It's constructive, but it's critique. It's critiquing and saying, not afraid to say, hey, your posture's off. Hey, let's get your form right. But they're, they're framing and saying ways that are building you up of where to go, not tearing you down. That's the key is if you tear people down, then there's no real incentive to want to come back and work for that person but if you mess up do just own it mm. like apologize and then just try to take those those learnings and lessons forward like I, I again i mess up all the time and you know frame stuff or say stuff that i'm like in hindsight man i could have said that better or mm. you know i'll realize later Hey, I wonder if that came across how I was trying to do it. And then just asking the person, you know, a lot of times they'll be honest and be like, yeah, that sucked. They're like, I didn't like that, you know? And mm -hmm. you'd be like, okay, well, I'm sorry. This was what my intentions were. If it had that effect, like, I'm sorry, that's not my goal I want. I hear you, I acknowledge you, and I'm going to try to be better moving forward. And usually just that acknowledgement is, is something that we often don't get when you're in high performance environments where mm -hmm. like, that's what I like. I don't care what it is you're doing. I like the high performance element of it. I like you could have a hobby. It's just like challenging yourself, you know, and, or you have work. It's like challenging yourself and you have to show up and leave it on the field and you're going to make mistakes and stuff. But again, trying to always be respectful of other people's agency and humanity. One thing that I found w when just chatting with people about Gin Lane is that there's this almost mythology about it now within like the new york design scene and design scene in general and everyone has had only amazing things to say from other past interviews or just personal connections with others and i'm curious what were the factors or characteristics that made gin lane so magical and has that resonance with these people who have gone on to leave start other agencies or are just working in other jobs now yeah, I think there's a reverse engineering answer to it. I think mm -hmm. there, there's, I'll talk on at the end of the answer, some of the things that I think are true parts of the reality of back then. But I think at a higher level, there's a less acknowledged truth was we ended it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know, I like rap music. And it's like, is Tupac or Notorious B.I.G. like the best, you know, and you could always be like, oh, well, Drake's better or Jay-Z or whatever. But like, Tupac and Taurus B.I.G., you know, or Chris Farley or Janis Joplin, you know, or whatever. They just died young. They died mm -hmm. before they did bad work. You know, they never really did bad work. And I think it's different, but I looked at like rap. I looked at boxing. I looked at sports and I kind of just saw like at that time, I felt like if you got over the hill, it was best just to retire like Derek Jeter or mm -hmm. Kobe on his farewell tour when you're kind of at the top of your game, but people can appreciate what you did for it versus just sticking around like someone who's at the party a little too late, you know? And so I think because we ended it, it there never was a, a bad story about what it fell apart or this didn't work, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think 
I think in some ways that that has worked because it we just ended it and it was a time and a place that like will always be kind of remembered for a select group of people. Um, I think in other ways like that was informed in part by like a scarcity mindset. I think I was also scared that we would do really whack work or we wouldn't be as I don't know like magical or special that we were, you know, and I think for little planes I'm almost trying to come back and say I'm in no rush. I have nothing to prove. I want to just work with great people again. I want to just be tapping back into some of the stuff that I think made Jin Lane and Pattern and stuff like really special and magic. And I want to do it in a way that can be fun and collaborative for this chapters of our lives for years and decades to come. And I, I think a lot of that was like, first of all, I think it was a lot of people when we were younger. And so is there a lot of people's first jobs or like first places where they were really and recognized and i think what i and then later you know my two partners nick and suze i think we tried and then you know like i would also say dan kanger and camille um there's people before that like rachel yeager there's just been so many great people but i was always trying to say to people like you're a leader you're a leader mm -hmm. like you are a leader and within that it, it's like there's been so much entrepreneurship that's come out of Jin Lane, you know, where people have their own agencies or they have their own businesses or brands. And I think that's what I'm most proud of is there's so many bosses, you know, like mm. I just on a call right before this with a friend, Rebecca Zhu, and she has soft services and, you know, her partner, David, you know, is an incredible designer and has an awesome store. And, you know, Alan Yu with the new startup, you know, like Rachel Yeager, who's on this podcast, like Dan Kanger, who's executive at Hims. like just the list goes on of people that are just doing phenomenal work. So I think it's, it, you know, it, it's creating a culture where you're, you're telling people they can be great every day. And I think in hindsight, there's probably times where I was a jerk and, you know, could push people hard and stuff. But I, I do think that message of like, misfits and outcasts and goonies and be the pirates not the navy and be to your own damn drummer like you can be who you want to be you're from a different country you're from a weird background whatever it is like just be your version of great there's not really a ton to add here because emmett really crushed it and really made it very very clear how he leads and how he can lead effective teams but what i took away personally was that this focus on your natural abilities and your talent and style of leadership is, is really the key. So focus on your vision and help people to see that or help other people to see the creative vision of the company that you're working with. And this will ultimately attract like-minded people to you, which is easier to lead them in particular because they're aligned and connected to you. So you can push them forward, but do so through the lens of empathy and encouragement instead of harsh, well, unconstructive criticism, always focusing on the constructive. But let's pivot from leadership and now dive into the world of transparency and how it connects to business, but also pricing with self-aware. I feel like we've touched on it so many times that we have to jump into your your notion doc. So, I mean, I'm not sure if I would have the courage to do what you did. And I know that you had built this so that it was anonymous, but you made a document of every client, every project that you've ever charged for. Um, it gives the context of the industry. It gives the price. But I guess from my perspective, that would take a lot of courage. Did you feel like that was a challenging thing to share? I guess the other side of that question is, what does transparency mean to you? And, and how do you think that it is a good thing for our industry to kind of help us all to grow? Well, when Jen publicized that document, it was kind of like a like I was, I, I feel did, like I went rogue she kind of went rogue a little bit. Which shout out rogue. <laughs> um, yeah, she did kind of go rogue a little bit. But whenever Jen does that I, I'm like hell yeah like I just because I well, I trust her so uh so yeah I was still I mean it got so much kind of traction on Twitter at the time when it was posted and people to this day will still tell us how helpful it is whether they're you know you know peers in the industry mm -hmm. people just getting started students or prospective clients that are just like that is so cool that you did that 
we've gotten really nothing but good feedback. Mm-hmm. You know, occasionally people will say like, oh, like, do you feel like, you know, that's weird to share that stuff? We haven't had any complaints. Mm-hmm. I think the, the fact that it's anonymous helps. I kind of just made that internally just so we could always see the journey. Because, I mean, you can really see how much the project budgets go up. Mm -hmm. first like when we first started um but something that i was super inspired by when we started self-aware was um haraf who Mm -hmm. is a Mm -hmm. studio they i think they probably stopped being a studio like when we were first starting like in 2018 or so Mm -hmm, approximately yeah um but i was just so inspired by their studio and they had this sense of play that I kind of like feel like we brought into self-aware and they shared when they stopped being a studio, they just shared their whole Google drive, which was just so amazing for someone who was just starting out because I was like, Oh, like I was like obsessed with how they even just organized their Google drive. Like just the structure of the whole <laughs> like, like, oh, amazing thing to be excited about. But I was like, I'm going to like organize our business super methodically like this too. And they had um, a spreadsheet, which is basically the same thing that I published, which, which is all of their clients and how much they got paid in the industry. Um, so I decided to post that. Uh, like two years ago and i kind of just believe i don't get that much traction on twitter like i have like a solid group of maybe 10 people who like my tweets <laughs> um shout out but um <laughs> it got a lot more traction than i was expecting so i kind of posted it thinking maybe 10 people would see it but it turned into probably thousands of people seeing it and like we still get views all the time because notion has like the analytics that you can see um and there's people who reach out and they're like oh do you mind if i make one based off of your template i'm like yeah Mm -hmm. um and i actually saw kind of an interesting conversation on twitter about this and kind of like i think there's some let's call them design grifters <laughs> who, who oh, let's share, get into it. <laughs> they, they share their, their, how much they make, but in a way that's kind of just ego driven in the conversation there, someone was like, Oh, I really like the way self-aware did this. Um, because it doesn't seem in any way like a brag. It's more as an educational tool. And that's, that's always what I wanted it to be. Like when I saw how much Haraf was charging, I was like, my mind was blown that I could make, that we can make that much money um, making websites. So I hope that there's people out there who are like, see our budgets now and they're like, oh my God, that's like, you know, that's a, that's a two person studio and they're able to do that. And I hope that's inspiring to people. There's a, a couple of questions that come to mind. And one is around kind of the the elevating yourselves, maybe internally as a studio, to feel that self-confidence to charge those prices that you think are appropriate to where you are now. Are you finding anything specific in your data as you're recording it that kind of has helped you to find the right clients or pitch more appropriately has seeing like the list and seeing like how it changes from year to year and where you are now influenced kind of anything in your or studio process going back to just the idea of like getting the confidence to actually say those prices um i think something that made us more confident to do that is actually doing big pre- some big projects for not enough and realizing mm. that, like we spent so much time and effort and just brain space you know doing this project and realize and then you kind of put it into perspective you think oh i made this much per week on this and you're like damn that's terrible (laughs) you know like uh so so i think doing work and realizing how hard it is and how much work goes into uh producing you know doing the website from concept to launch it's a lot it could be a lot of work um so that was a huge one and then further from there discovered this service 
called Waka Time. I think that's how you pronounce it. And so it's actually like an extension, like in my code editor mm. and checks my time in each file, literally down to the file. So I can go into the dashboard and see, oh yeah, I spent, you know, exactly this many hours on this specific feature, you know, like going down super granular. I would say that we're not great at time tracking outside of that. Mm-hmm. But I think even just that seeing like, oh, wow, I spent 500 hours on this project. <laughs> like stuff like that. Or it's like, oh, I spent 40 hours on this one. So you can start to see like a scale and, and get a better idea of how much to charge. So then you're thinking like, okay, well, how much do I want to make per week or per hour? Um, and then, uh, and then from there, we can look at our, our sheet and be like, okay, well, how much, what was our average, uh, fee last year for a project? So we just look at all the projects divided by how many projects there are, get the average. And then that can inform like, oh, well, maybe that's a sweet spot. So then, yeah, it's like over time we start to be like, okay, so maybe our, our starting, you know, budget is like around 40 K and up. Um, and then we are, we're finding even more clarity on like, what's our sweet spot for timeline. Mm. Um, Things can be consistent. I think across projects, it makes it easier for us to like execute and do really good work. Right in the beginning, like via email, if someone Mm. didn't state their budget, uh, like up front, like we probably would say it something like, you know, to set expectations, we typically charge around this for a website. Like we're pretty upfront about it and we can kind of go from there and be like, well, if that's workable, then we'd love to continue the conversation. So we're able to like, kind of weed out like before I even get a chance to get like excited and giddy about like the potential of a project. Like I can just like kind of like take a step back and be like, is this even feasible logistically? I'm pretty sure you told me at least three or four times that I don't charge enough at Rogue. Mm-hmm. And that's like three or four separate conversations. I remember each one. I think like there was one in Boston prior to starting Rogue where I was freelancing and I was like, oh, maybe Mike would want to do something on this. And and you were just like, that is pretty low for what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And, and every single time you said it, it's like, I already knew that it was too low, but I didn't know how to get it higher. And I think one of it is like a self-confidence thing where like, I'm afraid to say the bigger number because I'm already assuming that they're going to say no, or just it won't fall, it won't fall into place. And it's breaking that cycle where you're limiting yourself from saying the number because there should be a negotiation when you're charging for things. I mean, in our American culture, we don't really have like a a barter back and forth system, but a lot of the world does have that. So it's like, and and for some reason, when when there's like an exchange of, creative goods there is sort of that kind of negotiating back and forth and a lot of other industries aren't like that it's like doctors say a price and that's it or like Mm -hmm. you pay this much for braces and it or like this much for a mechanic but it's like learning from those industries and applying the things that are really good to what we do is something that i've been looking at and trying to like diagnose or dissect in a way to get to a a creative solution and so that those moments were kind of really big level up moments and i think now maybe we're finally at the point where i think about the team i'm like okay i think about my team i think about their families i think about my wife and i'm just like i gotta provide for these people like i can't just like i can't fuck up and charge too low like that's rude to them Definitely in the beginning, that confidence was, it it was hard to say big numbers. But I think like what has always helped us is just being like, well, this is how much we want to make a week. I think that that's the easiest way for for me to look at it versus like, you know, per hour or something. Mm -hmm. But like, if we can make this much a week, then then we feel good. And our lifestyle, like that's where we want to be with our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um. So when, you know, when someone's, when we give someone a price and we give them the time and then they say, well, can you do it for like 15 K less? It's kind of like, well, no, because that's how much we're trying to make per week. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what we tend to do is say like, okay, well, for example, oh, you wanted to build this on WordPress. We're a lot faster doing sanity. Mm-hmm. So we can do it for 15k if 
or 15k less if you let us build it on sanity i think starting to introduce some of those like okay or we're gonna take away um Mm -hmm. this feature and if that's something you want to do when you have that money like we can Mm -hmm. come back to it Mm -hmm. like treating it more like that has Mm -hmm. really helped with i think just getting paid what we want to get paid and i think that also builds trust and respect too because then you're just setting that precedent of like well we're not just gonna like do it for less for no reason like that's Mm kind of that's honestly like confusing to a client like you Mm -hmm. made the metaphor to other industries of like like this costs this much money like costs this much to get braces or whatever uh you know like if you go to the supermarket and you say, well, actually, I'm not going to get this box of cereal, you're going to pay less money. So it's like, yeah. or if you add more cereal, then you're going to get more, you're going to spend more. So it's like, uh, I think like, yeah, I think actually like without realizing it, like clients actually like, it's actually probably better for them to be like held accountable for like, oh, if, it, if we want to go lower, it's going to be probably be like a lower scope. That being said, um, I actually, when I watched um, Rachel Yeager's episode of the pod, Like she was like expressing how like if it's something that they're really excited and passionate about, that human is willing to take stuff on and make it work, and that's totally true too. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like how like just earnest and like candid about that Rachel was because there's no reason to like hide that. Like you know if if we're really excited about a project and potential collaboration, um, of course we'll try to make it work for a little less than maybe we usually would, depending on our availability and you know kind of where we're at. Yeah, you know, maybe there is a project where we're actually making more than than we like expected. Like maybe it's going faster than we thought, and right. we're actually doing well with that project. We maybe we could take on something that is really inspiring to us, but they're they have a lower budget, um, and they're really cool people. We believe you know, in what they're doing. Yeah, I love how transparent. Mike and Jenny are. And it really did change the way that I think about sharing information and what information I am willing and want to share, especially on this, uh, uh, on this podcast publicly. And what I really took away is that there's no real reason to safeguard information in our particular industry. The secret sauce is you, not some tactic or keyboard shortcut Information truly is power, and the more that we share, the more that we can all grow together. That's what I took away, and I think that that's the empowering message. If you help another, you're helping yourself, you're solidifying that information and passing it down for maybe a next generation of designers if you're older and have more experience. But regardless of where you are on your journey, you have something important to say and to share. So teach, learn, let's all be more transparent. It's not, you know, giving out all the secrets. It really is just sharing and making our world a little bit better. Like we say at the end of every single episode of Loki Legends. But let's move away from transparency and into the world of growing an audience with Dan Maul. So these are some numbers from your social profiles. You have 43K followers on Twitter. 36k on LinkedIn and you have a newsletter of 50k readers. I'm assuming that audience plays a huge factor in in the kind of sales of your products in general and I was curious what have you done in order to cultivate and grow a community of that size? Because one thing I've noticed about you Dan is that you are an incredible storyteller and you share these very short stories that seem to be not about the topic of design or entrepreneurship at all. It could be a cast iron skillet. It could be uh, something like completely off the rails, but it always ties into this tangible lesson. Are those two related, uh, your ability as a storyteller in the cultivation of your audience? Uh, I'm not sure I have a conclusion about that yet, but all signs point to yes. So, uh, you know, so like part of why I started a newsletter is that I didn't have one. And I've I've been on Twitter for since 2007 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it took me 13, 14 years to grow 40,000 some subscribers on on Twitter. Um, My newsletter, I started a year and a half ago. So it's from, from, I think I had like 200 or something like that. So those 50,000 newsletter subscribers that's happened in a year and a half. And, 
And what I was testing was like, how fast can I grow a new audience? Because I didn't know what that was. Um, I didn't have a newsletter when I sold the workbook. Um, it was mostly through Twitter and mostly through, link, through uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I, I, if there's one thing that I have done consistently in the last year and a half, it's write a newsletter every week. Mm. Um, every week, I, I haven't missed one. I haven't missed one. Um, so I think I'm on like week 70 something now, something like that. Uh, so, so I've sent 70 newsletters out and like I've watched that grow exponentially. And I'm like, all right, if I do a thing every week, like it pays dividends. It didn't at first, but you know, as everybody says, like it, it hockey sticks, um, you know, it, it up, ups and to the rights. Um, and even within the newsletter, there's some, there's some that are just duds. There's some that I phone in. And then there's all sorts of mixes in that. There's some that I, there's some that I phone in that are duds. It's like, that makes sense. There's some that I phone in that are like total hits where I'm like, what? There's some that I'm like, this is going to be a banger and it's totally flops, right? So there's all sorts of mixes in that. The things that I get the most responses to is when I write stories. Like mm -hmm. When I write some sort of like metaphor or like a, like a story from my own experience. And I get a lot of feedback about those. I don't get a lot of feedback about like my teachy stuff. Like anything where I'm teaching, everybody's like, whatever, fine like thumbs up. But the ones where I'm like, Oh, let me tell you a story about how I worked on this project. And the, and the, like the one specific thing that you, that you might not have done on your projects that I did here that really did a good job. And those are the ones I get feedback on a lot. So I've just relegated to go like, I guess people are interested in stories, um, which duh, of course they are, right? Like, of course, Dan, they are. Um, and I'm like, I actually, I didn't know this, but with the feedback, I'm like, I guess I have a lot of stories to tell. Mm. You know, I've been I've been working since I was in eighth grade right, as a web designer. Uh, I have a lot of web design experience, design experience that I can share. And it's not it's not this big stuff. It's the little stuff that people are like, that's a really good tip. Thank you. I'll take that today. So I'm like, I wonder what those are. And my newsletter is just my way of like trying to dredge those up from my memory and going like, all right, what did I do in 2017? What projects did I work on? And so I'm mm -hmm. having fun just going through my archive and going like, oh yeah, I did work on that with Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School. And there was that cool moment that one day at the kickoff. Let me write about that thing. So just looking back at like my old notes and my like, uh, and you, you know, you asked about me like sharing all this stuff. I've kept the blog since 2005 and it's because I've never felt like I've had a good memory. So I'm like, I have to catalog these things. I catalog all the time, not because I'm compulsive about it, because I'm like, I'm going to lose my memory one day. I feel it going. And I, and I like reading my blog. I, I, I was reading it yesterday and I read the post that I wrote when I got married. Like I forgot that I had written that. I, obviously I remember I got married, but I wrote that. I wrote a blog post about it. I wrote a blog post about um, about getting standing in line to get the first iPhone. I forgot about that. I wrote a blog post about a shirt that I got at Abercrombie and Fitch. Also, I, I forgot about that too. Like, you know, but that was from 10 years ago, no, 15 years ago. And so like, I'm having fun doing that. I don't know what that's going to turn into yet, but um, it stresses me out <laughs> lately to think about what, oh, what is this going to turn into? So I'm really trying hard to just be like, if it's fun, I'm going to try to do it. And then we'll mm -hmm. see if it turns into something. Um, but that's that's a lot of what's directing my attention lately. 50K in a year and a half. I think we got to dive in more. But um, what I what I loved and I heard in that is that that you're doing this obviously for your audience, but for you, for your own memory and just kind of recalling these lessons and stories that just have happened that that are seemingly small and nuanced to you, but super impactful to someone else, especially translated through stories. And I think the intentionality is super key. I think consistency is super key. Um, are there other specific factors that have led to the specific growth? It's going to sound like the consistency one, but practice. Mm -hmm. like it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's related to consistency, but it's different. You know, like I'm practicing something. It's not just I'm showing up and doing it, you know, and sometimes I phone it in. I, you know, I'll admit that sometimes it's my newsletter goes out every Friday at 10 and sometimes Friday at nine, I'm writing, you know, like, <laughs> it out, right? but, but uh, mo most of the time it's like, I'm trying to practice something hmm. I'm trying to do. And, and I've taken that approach to a lot of things in my life, you know, that, uh, that are business related, not business related. Like I've played basketball, um, every Monday night for the last, for the last three years now. Mm. Um, and what I realized is like, the more I practice something, the more into the details I get. When I first started playing basketball, it was like, let me learn to shoot. 
right? Like a very broad thing. Let me learn to dribble, a very broad thing. The better you get at that, the more practice you get. There's still stuff to work on. There's always stuff to work on, but the stuff you work on gets more nuanced. So I'm not learning to shoot now. I'm learning where to put my elbow. Like, because mm-hmm. that's the thing that as I, you know, I have a GoPro that I use every, every time, you know, I film my, about my basketball games and I go, oh, that's where I put my elbow. That's weird. Like, and as mm-hmm. I'm reading stuff about it or watching YouTube video, I'm like, oh, my elbow placement is really throwing off my shot. Like, and, and I'm not doing that for any given reason other than just like, I want to get better at it to get better at it. I'm not trying to be a pro basketball player or anything like that. <laughs> it's fun. It's a thing that I get to work on. I get the thing I get to practice. I get, you know, I get my steps in. Um, but like the things that you work on get more nuanced and like that makes sense to me as from being a designer for a long time. When I first learned to be a designer, you got to work on the big stuff, grids, typography. What do I work on now? Like the nuances of all that stuff. Do you use an asymmetrical grid or a symmetrical grid? Do I use a 14 column grid or a 15 column grid? Like you get into the nuances of the things that you're doing as you get better at it, as you practice on it. And so that's one of the things that I'm enjoying about writing a newsletter every week is like, sometimes I'm like, I want to try to be funny in this one, you know, like, cause I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not naturally funny. Like, I mean, let me work on my comedy. Let me work on my timing. Um, and like, those are things that I can see myself getting better at. So like, it just gives me an opportunity to practice, which I, which I think that is the part of that I enjoy also. And it, and it then reinforces like, well, the more consistent I am about it, the more I get to practice it, the better I get it. So it's like, it becomes this virtuous cycle, it becomes this flywheel now, you know, once it's actually going, um, it's just hard to get it started. Because, you know, when it started, I didn't know what I was practicing. No one was really reading. I didn't get a lot of feedback. So, like, it's lonely. But I think that's also a benefit at first. It's like, well, no one's watching. So I'll just do something. (laughs) Well, you get to, like, experiment and test and try new things to see what people are interested in specifically. Um, I'm curious if you get caught up in the numbers at all of these things. I, I feel like that's my biggest challenge of posting these things on YouTube is I directly have the analytics to look at how does each video do what are people interested in like do i specifically focus on the type of content that people are giving me likes and praise for or do i make a holistic rounded series of content and interviews to bring to people that are going to enrich them as a as a creative from end to end and and uh, i mean i'm a high performer by nature or by choice. I'm not sure which. <laughs> so I care about the the analytics and the numbers and want it to do well because I think it should based on the the level of commitment and, and ultimately like a commitment to my guests to get show them in the best light and to make them proud, if you will. I wish I cared less about numbers. I do care about them. Um, yeah. I think there's benefit in it. Um, for all the reasons that you just said, like, I think there's, there's, it gives you an indication of what people are interested in. Um, what I hate is that it's so tied to the algorithm too. It's so tied to like, mm-hmm. well, you know, if more people are interested then the algorithm does, you know, like, all, like, so it, that feels gross somehow, you know, like I don't, I don't have a better word for it. And then, and the other part of it is one thing that over the last two years of therapy, my therapist is trying to convince me of is she's like, Dan, you're an artist. I'm like, no, I'm not. Like I've I've always had this, like this pushback against the fact no, I'm a designer and not an artist design and art are different and design like all that stuff. And she's like, you're an artist. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm a designer. I like, she's like, you're an artist. (laughs) And so I've been trying to embrace that. Like, okay, let's, let's try it on and go like, if I'm an artist, what, what, what would an artist do here? Mm. And I think artists in general, you know, are doing their thing for them, not for their audience. And so it, it's weird to do a thing. And, and that part of that resonates with me where like, I've written, you know, the way that I've always thought about my blog is I'm writing it down for me. I'm journaling, I'm just doing it publicly. So if somebody else gets the, some benefit from that, that's a bonus. I'm not actually doing it for that, though. I'm yeah. doing it, you know, to, to log it for me. Um, I'm just doing them in public spaces because the public tools are actually better than the private tools, you know, until recently, you know, blogger was, has always been good at letting you journal. It's just that, that, you know, like you can start a private blog, but it's it's an extra checkbox I have to check to make it private. So I'll just keep it public, you know? Um, so the, the artist in me is like saying like, well, just do that. Like, do what you like, write what you enjoy it's just hard to to deny that like part of what I enjoy and why I enjoy it is that other people enjoy it too. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, that's part of the enjoyment for me is like, I, I'm a, one thing I've, I've identified this in a workshop last year that I took is that one of my, my fundamental character traits is that I'm a sharer. I like sharing the things that I have. I always have. 
if I have, you know, a carton of milk, I'll split it with like, I, as a kid, I used to do that all the time. I would pour half of it with, for somebody else. So like, that's inherently in me. So I like sharing the things that I have and that inherently involves uh, someone else. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's hard for like, I don't know how to separate those things. Um, and so looking at numbers indicates to me sometimes, oh, I have shared this thing successfully. People are interested in this. They like what I have had to share with them. So I want to do more of that because it feeds my ego and it makes me feel happy and all of that stuff. So I wish I had a better way to think about numbers right now. It's really jumbled for me um, because I can't tell sometimes, am I just chasing the numbers? Like, is it, is it the numbers itself that I'm chasing or is it, are the numbers a lagging indicator of something good happening, you know, elsewhere in my artistry? I, I don't, I wish I knew a, a clearer answer to that. Yeah, it, it's really difficult to not put your self worth into the numbers, and that that's the separation that that I have to do on a, a given day. And that goes to same thing with like Rogue Studio as a business is like the financial health and not making that part of my like identity as well. Like knowing that there's like ebbs and flows, and month to month it'll be different. Project lead times, like you said, are different, so it's it's not a fact of you not doing well, but uh, a sign of the times, if you will. And I don't know if you have any tips for kind of separating that, or if it's just talking to a therapist or just personally journaling or stoicism. <laughs> sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, self-care is definitely a big part of it. Yes. Like, you know, do things for yourself, everyone. I think that's, that's really helpful. I do think that, you know, there's maybe this is a contrarian take, but um, I don't agree with the the saying um, comparison is the thief of joy. You know, I've mm. heard that a lot, but I compare myself a lot and it helps me, uh, you know, because, and I think partly because I can maintain perspective on it. But there are a lot of people that I admire that are starting new things lately. And I see, you know, things as simple as like people that I admire that I'm like, that person's killing it. And then and they're starting a YouTube channel and their YouTube channel has like a pittance of views. And I don't take like the, the thing that gives me comfort about that is not that I see them more low than it's not that mm -hmm. like, oh, that person sucks like I do. No, it's that person's great. I know that they're great. And so a great person is doing that thing. You know, mm -hmm. a great person can have low YouTube views. That means that I, as a great person, can also have have low YouTube. Like it mm -hmm. helps me to go like, oh, that actually brings me up to their level in my mind sometimes rather than bringing them down to my level, you know, or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. I, it doesn't make me think that they are any less good than they are because I hold them in such high esteem and, and high regard. It's like that that now normalizes it for me. It, it makes it part of the culture. It makes it like, oh, that's normal for a good person, somebody who's really good at a thing and, and smart and clever and experienced and you know, all that stuff to be starting a new thing and for it to have low traction at the beginning. That's not bad. Like low traction is different than like to have a bad YouTube channel. It doesn't mean they have a bad YouTube channel. It just means they have low traction because they're starting it. Like that makes sense. And so it gives me a lot of encouragement. So I know a lot of people don't do well with comparison. If, if you're mm -hmm. that kind of person, don't do that, you know. But for me, a lot of the comparison helps because it helps to give me a reference point, you know, for a lot of things. And, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I think that's part of the transparency that you talked about earlier. Like the fact that that's transparent, the fact that I can see how many likes this tweet gets and how many, you know, you views this YouTube uh, thing gets, it's a, it, that helps me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not to say it's a double, it's not a double edged sword. It is yeah. when I see something that like really blows up, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing? I'm terrible. Like, so there, there definitely is that part too. Um, but I try to take the good of that part and, you know, the, discard the bad a little bit more. I, I honestly think I'm in, in alignment too, because I compare myself maybe to a fault to other people. And I think where in, in the, what I've realized is the difference is like knowing that everyone's doing their own thing, that they have their own unique personality, that their business is set up in a certain way, that we're entirely servicing different clients, even if they're maybe in the same vertical or uh, field, if you will, but I'm going to attract people for a certain reason. They're going to attract people for a certain reason. And it also just helps to elevate my taste. So it's, it's almost like turning off the negative self-talk and just appreciating and like cheering for them and clapping for them. Um, like being their cheerleader from a distance, but learning from what they're doing because I'll never be able to replicate it. And I shouldn't because ultimately I should be forming my own perspective my work should reflect what I'm doing, what my team's doing. And, and ultimately, if it's a client project, it has to service their needs. So it would be selfish to just copy someone else's style because it wouldn't be in service of the client. I love that. 
Yep. The, for a long time, I've been looking for models. Mm. Um, I, I, I have pretty unique ideas, I think. And, and like, you know, super friendly at the time was a unique idea, to, which I wasn't to say that no one was doing it, but fewer people were doing it than, than are now. And so what's tough for, I think, people who have unique ideas is that there's not a lot of models to follow. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it a lonely path because you feel like you have to figure out everything on your own. And so I, I always look for models. I always look for people that are like, oh, I want to do. And recently I've been lucky to find some models, but then I, it, then it goes the other way where then I'm like, yeah, but now I'm, am I just copying them? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it has, because I'm less practiced at that idea or that kind of comparison, it's taken some friends and, and some, you know, some people to kind of point out to me that like, no, 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 look like look at how your flavor of that would be very different. Like, even if you followed that model exactly, the fact that it's you would make it really different. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And so like, that's a, that's an interesting new door that I'm exploring, you know, to go like, okay, so what if I did do that? Cause I'm worried that like, well, I'm going to copy somebody. If I copy them, then I'm like taking away from them somehow. And mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Like it just brings up all of that stuff. And I'm like, all right, I think I'm going to try this for a bit, practice that and, and really see if the thing that I'm, I'm fearful of is, is actually something to be afraid of. The lesson here is that the process should feel like practice. And here's the definition of practice. To perform an activity or exercise, a skill repeatedly or regularly, in order to improve or maintain one's proficiency. It takes reps, not just in the gym or on the field, but in our own lives and careers. Building takes time and whatever you're building, just ignore the BS, the influencers that are trying to sell you these quick get rich schemes. Practice is where we actively work to get better without fear of being perfect. It's where we can experiment and push so that we know that we're capable and we can honestly level up in that moment. So I'm gonna leave you with a quote from basketball coach John Wooden. Good things take time, as they should. We shouldn't expect good things to happen overnight. Actually getting something too easily or too soon can cheapen the outcome. I'm gonna let you mull that one over, but let's make the world a better place and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.